So welcome back for another physics lab, this time in my garage at home. Uh, this one, we're looking at law of conservation of momentum and law of conservation of energy. We're going to create some collisions between two dynamics cars, and we want to study when is the momentum conserved versus when is the kinetic energy being conserved in these collisions. So our setup looks something like this. We've got a track set up right here on my bench, nice and level. I made sure you get it level. Little feet here where you can adjust to make sure it's level. You just don't want one car just naturally wanting to roll down the hill one way or the other. You want it to be there nice and stationary so that you know gravity's not playing any part in speeding up or slowing down as a car as it moves one way or the other. All right, we got Lab quest over here right now, notice it's measuring a position of zero meters. It's measuring right now the position of this teal car. We're going to call this one car number one. And as I kind of move it here just slightly, you can see it up there in the top, how that's tracking the position of this car. It's doing that by using this motion encoder here on the end. This motion encoder is talking uh, to this car that I have turned on. And the way it's working, it uses Bluetooth. But on the bottom of this car right here, you can see the little sensors, and you actually see them on my camera, the infrared light, that you can't see that with your naked eye, but you can see it on the camera right here. And what it's doing is tracking these black and white lines. As it passes over those, it's using those to determine how far it's actually traveled. So this is car one, the teal one right here. This is going to be car two. Uh, that we're using over here is the gray one and right now everything's set up for runs one through three and to do those right here on the end of the car I know it's hard to see but you got velcro attached little velcro tabs so that when the cars are going to collide what's going to happen is they want to get stuck together right here and this is going to create for us our inelastic collisions all right, so one of the first things you want to do looking at your data tables over here, find the mass for each one of these cars. So I've got a scale here. Let me take a second, turn that on, and start with car number one. Let me flip it upside down so it doesn't roll off. 320 grams. Now, if you'll notice over here on my data table, we actually want kilograms here. So if we convert this to kilograms, we have 0 0.320 kilograms. All right, so that's number one. Let's get the mass of number two. All right, number two, a little bit more massive, but they're pretty close, and that's important in this experiment that they're fairly close. 326 grams, so 0 0.326 kilograms. Uh, and then notice right here, when we do run number six, we're going to make mass, or car two, a little more massive. So that's what these masses right here are. So I'm going to just stack them on top for right now so we can get this total mass. And it's going to be important that you only use this number when you're talking about cart number two and trial number six. But 824 grams so we're gonna record that over here is 0 0.824 kilograms okay so let me get it all set back up and we'll start running our trials all right, so we're set up for run number one. Now runs one, two, three, they're all going to be pretty similar. So I'm just going to show you run number one here. But we got our car sitting here stationary. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to start collecting my data. I'm going to give this car a push. Okay, notice it collides with the second car. And once that collision occurs, causes it to really slow down. And so if we look at our data, we got something that looks like this. We had no velocity at all. I gave car number one a push. It's got this large velocity. It collides with car number two, and now everything's moving a little bit slower. And so if you look at your data table, we need to find, well, what was the velocity of car one before this collision actually occurs? So I'm going to come over here to my lab quest, and I'm going to show you this on the um, larger screen here in just a second as well. But I want to highlight right here. I'm going to highlight this 
the plateau just before the collision occurred. We want to analyze that. So we're going to look at the statistics for that velocity. All right, I'm going to come over here where you can see it a little bigger now. And what we're looking for, what is the average velocity before that collision? So you see the mean right here. Okay, this mean 0 0.529 meters per second. That's how fast car number one was traveling prior to the collision. Okay. Now we need to do the same thing to figure out what is the speed immediately after the collision here. So let me get my screen reoriented here for a second. Sorry. All right. So I want to come over here. I want to highlight right after this collision occurred. And this time I'm going to go to analyze. First thing I have to do is uncheck the stats I had up here for the top. Come back, do it a second time. So I can get the stats for this second part. Okay. So now as I come back over and show you the big screen, right there in between the brackets, that's what we analyzed. During that portion, we see a mean or an average velocity of 0 0.256. Right? And here's the main key, 0 0.256. Because those two cars were connected together, they had the same final velocity after the collision occurs. All right, so I'm going to do the same thing for runs two and three. I'm going to record those results the same way, and then I'll show you those once I've got those done for you. So I ran trials two and three, or runs two and three, the way I have them labeled on this page. And so you can see my results. Sorry for my sloppy handwriting on number two. That's 0 0.591 meters per second. So I pushed it a little faster than I did trial one. And trial three is just about the same. And so you can see recorded the results after the collision. Now trials three, or sorry, trials four and five, a little bit different. So let me show you how it changed the setup. Still kept our motion encoder here on one end, but I added a second motion encoder on the other end. And now what we need to do is we need to take and turn on car number two. So it's gonna be speaking to the second motion encoder here. And what I've also done, I switched out the Velcro tabs we were using for magnetic tabs. And I turned all these tabs with the north pole of the magnet facing outward. And what that means is these two cars are going to repel each other here. And that's just going to be important so that we create an elastic collision. One other thing I need to do to make this all work correctly is I need to reverse one of these motion detectors or motion encoders and that way they will both think positives going in the same direction as each other. All right, so let's try that run number four again. Got everything fixed up the way I want it to. All right, so I'm gonna start my data collection. I'm gonna give car one a push. Okay. Car two heads to the end of the track. Car one, notice, comes to a stop right there. And we get a graph now that looks something like this. The blue line's tracking car number one. The purple line's tracking car number two. So we need to analyze those the same way we did before to find the velocity of car one is going to be right up here, this first plateau, and the velocity of car two after the collision right up here, this plateau. And you can notice on your table here, car two is always stationary before the collision. But now after the collision, car number one comes to a rest. And so we're just on trials or runs four and five. I need to find these two values after the collision and car one after the collision, or sorry, car one before the collision. So let me get those numbers and I will show them to you. All right, so right now you're seeing the um, results from run number five. You're seeing right now this mean, this 0.561. That's the speed of car two, that purple plateau up there. That's its average speed after the collision. Okay, same way we did for runs one, two, and three. And so those results over here for run number four and five, you can see again what we're doing, getting the speed of car one before the collision, speed of car number two after the collision. And notice they're pretty close to each other. That's good. All right, so I got trial or run number six set up over here. Main change is we added these extra masses on top of the car number two right here. 
And so as we go to run this one, if I start my data collection, give car number one a push. Okay, notice the difference this time. Notice now car number one came back to me over here. And so now as we look at our graph results, it looks a little different. That car number one, we had this positive velocity. Car number two is going much slower than car number one was in the first place. But now we also need to find what is the speed of car number one after the collision. Notice it's going to be a negative value. I should say velocity instead of speed right there. So now we need to find these three results. So let me get those numbers and I'll come back and show those to you. So I've got that run number six up here on the screen. And what you're seeing, last thing I did right there, I found that final velocity of car number one after the collision. And so you're seeing that negative velocity over this negative 0.192. Again, because that car returned back to the motion encoder where it started at. And so those results right here. So you got your original velocity, your two velocities this time after the collision, two different velocities after the collision. Now the rest of this is all about making calculations. So in this first chart here, you're calculating momentum. So what you want to remember from chapter seven is that when you calculate momentum, that's the letter P, momentum is an object's mass times its velocity. So it's gonna get repetitive, but what you're doing is you're taking, say, car number one times each of its masses before the collision, that's going to tell you the momentum of car one before the collision. Do the same thing. Car two, notice they're already filled in all zeros because it had no momentum before the collision ever started. Got some zeros filled in here where car number one stopped after the collision, so it had no momentum. Okay. And the other thing, you want the total momentum before this collision. So what you're doing, you're just adding these two columns together. That's easy enough because this whole column is zero. The total momentum before the collision is just number one's momentum before the collision. Total momentum after the collision, now you want to take the momentum of number one after, momentum of number two after, add those together. And then final column over here, you want to get this ratio. Take the total momentum after the collision, divide it by the total momentum before the collision. So right here, I'm just looking for a decimal, you know, zero point whatever this decimal is, um, just to give you that ratio. And then the bottom chart, very, very similar, except you're calculating now kinetic energy. And so this kinetic energy is going to equal the mass times the velocity squared over 2. Okay? And notice, there's a note on here, this kinetic energy, it's not a vector. It can't be a negative number. Um, but the momentum up here when you're dealing again with trial number six and car number one after the collision, it's going to have a negative momentum because momentum can be negative because it's a vector. Um, just bear in mind when you're talking about using this speed right here for run number six, we use this different mass for car number two. Okay, so complete these charts, answer your questions at the end. So I hope this lab gives you some idea about the difference between inelastic collisions that we started with. The two objects collided, they stuck together, and then we had elastic collisions at the end where we used the magnets, the two cars collided, but they didn't actually physically touch, they didn't actually stick together with each other, and how those two different types of collisions that ideally they both conserve momentum but only elastic collisions can serve kinetic energy. As always, if you have questions, you need any help, reach out to me. I'm here to help. All right, y'all take care, and I will talk to you later.